Would you please open your Bibles at the first chapter of the Gospel of John, at the passage beginning from verse 19. Now, last week we saw that after the profound theological statements of the first 18 verses, in verse 19, John turns to a simple narrative concerning the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, introduced by the public testimony of John the Baptist. John's ministry was clearly immensely popular and it attracted the attention of the Jewish leaders and they sent a delegation to investigate and in answer to their questions John said very plainly that no he was not the Christ and he was not Elijah come back and he was not the prophet of whom Moses had spoken. Who was he then? He was simply the voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. John himself was of no importance. His only importance lay in the message which he brought. He was merely the herald going ahead of the king and announcing the imminent arrival of the king himself. Well, we saw that the very next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him, returning from the wilderness, and John pointed to Jesus and cried out before all the people, Look, the Lamb of God! who takes away the sin of the world. We have that in verse 29, and last week we spent time looking together at something of the significance of that saying. The Lamb of God, the ultimate Lamb, the Lamb who was prefigured by all the sacrificial lambs of the Old Testament, but now the one who by his one great final sacrifice reconciled all his people to God once and forever. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well then, John's testimony continues in verses 30 and 31. John goes on to say, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. Now in these words, John continues to fulfill his work of identifying Jesus as being the Messiah of whom he and the Old Testament prophets had spoken. And he emphasizes that this is a matter of divine revelation, not mere personal opinion. I did not know him. Mere flesh and blood had not made this known to him. But God, who had sent him, he had sent him expressly for the purpose of revealing to Israel that this Jesus was the Christ. And he tells us how this was confirmed to him. He tells us this in verse 32. John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. 
he refers back to Jesus' baptism, which we read about in Matthew chapter 3. And there, John had been present and had witnessed what happened when Jesus, coming out of the baptismal water, was standing praying, and the heaven was opened, and John saw the Spirit descending like a dove and remaining upon Jesus. And God had already shown to John that the one upon whom the Spirit came in this way, he was the one who would baptize others with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 34, John says, And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now, in this testimony, what we find, or what I see at any rate, are three great principal truths. The first two relate specifically to the work of Christ, and the third to the person of Christ as the only one qualified to do the work. So, first of all, in verse 29, he speaks of Jesus as the Lamb of God. And then in verse 33, he speaks of Jesus as the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 34, he says, this is the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God. He is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of God. Now, that last one, he is the Son of God, I don't intend to take that as a separate topic because the whole Gospel is written to bear witness that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so, as we continue in our studies throughout this Gospel, time and time and time again, chapter after chapter, we shall be confronted with the testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. So we're not going to treat that as a separate sermon. And then the Lamb of God, we considered that last week. And so today we are going to look at verse 33. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Let us then first of all notice that verses 29 and 33 together give a comprehensive summary of the saving work of Christ. Christ's work may be divided into two great parts. First of all, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away sin. This speaks of the great objective work of Christ. His offering up himself a sacrifice for the sins of his people. By that one offering, all the people of God are forever justified, reconciled to God, their sin is forgiven because it has been atoned for, the judgment of God against the sins of believers has fallen upon Christ as their substitute. All of this is objective. It took place in history. And it took place outside of ourselves. And it results in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus being reckoned to the believer. So that we stand before God in what Martin Luther described as that alien righteousness. The righteousness which is not ours, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that is the first part of the saving work of Christ. 
the objective taking away of the guilt of sin. But we must be clear that that is not everything. Salvation is not only about forgiveness. It's not only about the removal of our punishment and standing in a legally right relationship with God. That is the first part, and that is a very important part, but it is not the whole of the work of salvation. The second part of Christian salvation is subjective. It is to do with the inward transformation of the sinner resulting in personal holiness, personal righteousness, a life of fellowship with God. And this is not something which could take place outside us, by its very nature it is something that takes place in the heart and mind and life of the Christian. And it's something that takes place during the course of our lives. It's something that happens within our personal experience. One of the best ways I know to make the distinction here is that used by uh, Professor Murray in his great book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. And uh, uh, the very title gives us the two great aspects of the work of redemption. Redemption accomplished once for all in history by the Lord Jesus, something outside of ourselves altogether. And then redemption applied, that work of atonement being applied personally in the course of our lives by the Holy Spirit. Well, in verse 29, John speaks of the objective uh, accomplishment of redemption, the atonement for our sins by the Lamb of God. And then in verse 33, he now talks about the other part, which is he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And the second part of our salvation is applied to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, this expression, baptism with the Spirit, has been a very controversial expression. It became controversial with the rise of two movements in church history. First of all, in the early part of the 20th century, the rise of Pentecostalism. And then, uh, in the year 1960, the rise of the Charismatic Movement. And both of these movements taught that baptism with the Spirit is a definitive second experience in the life of each believer. That is something separate from conversion, that it is something which must be sought as a second blessing after you have become a Christian. Now, briefly, let us just look at the various references in the Bible to baptism with the Spirit. There are only seven references in the New Testament. First of all, each of the four Gospels records the words of John the Baptist, which we read in Matthew 3.11 in our second reading. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that's clearly the same uh, saying as John records here. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, each of the four Gospels records that saying, so that accounts for four of the references out of seven. 
They all refer to the one single saying of John the Baptist, he will baptize you with the Spirit. And then we also have in Acts chapter 1, the words of the Lord Jesus, who says, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And clearly, our Lord himself is taking up and reiterating the words of John. So even this goes back to that one saying of John, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then, after the conversion of Cornelius, Peter speaks about it in this way. He says, then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And there, Peter, in Acts chapter 11, is referring back to the words of Jesus in chapter 1, which is referring back to the words of John the Baptist. So in fact, out of the seven references to baptism with the Spirit, six of these references are all simply repetitions of the same saying of John, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And our Lord very clearly tells us when that was fulfilled. In Acts 1, 5, we already read it, Jesus says, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus said these words shortly before he was taken unto he up into heaven, and ten days after that, the Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. That is exactly what the Lord said would happen. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now on the day of Pentecost. And so six of these seven references in the New Testament, six of them are quite expressly to the day of Pentecost itself. When the Spirit was poured out upon the Christian church. Now there's only one other reference, and that is in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And there Paul writes to the Corinthian believers in these words, he says, For with one Spirit we were all baptized into one body whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we have all been made to drink into one spirit. Notice here that there is this great emphasis upon the all. By one spirit we were all baptized into one body. We have all been made to drink into that one spirit. And clearly he means all Christians. He's certainly including the Corinthian Christians whose behaviour as Christians frequently fell very far short of what it ought to have been. But even they, because they are Christians, he says, we have all been baptised into the one body of Christ. We have all been made to drink of that one spirit. And when we look at this, and when we look at the overall teaching of the New Testament throughout, we are left in not the smallest doubt that the gift of the Holy Spirit is no second experience that the Christian must seek and agonize for. The gift of the Holy Spirit is part and parcel of being a Christian. To be a Christian is to have life in the Holy Spirit. Now, we see this quite explicitly in a number of passages. First of all, on the day of Pentecost, 
when um, the crowd are convicted of sin and they begin to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Jesus says, uh, Peter says rather, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is part and parcel of the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus, your sin will be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Writing in Romans 8 verse 9, Paul says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. You see how closely he identifies belonging to Christ, being a Christian, with being indwelt by the Spirit. If anyone does not have the Spirit, he is not Christ's. And then Jude, in verse 19, he sports speaking about ungodly hypocrites who have come into the church and are causing trouble with false teaching and immoral behavior and so on. And in verse 19 he says, These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. They are not Christians. One evidence of their not being, not being Christians is they do not have the Holy Spirit. And so uh, John is speaking about the fact that as a result of the work of the Lord Jesus, as a result of his work as the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world and then being taken up into heaven, he will give the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. We read toward the end of Peter's great Pentecostal sermon in Acts 2, this Jesus God raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. The Holy Spirit is given to God's people he is given to all God's people and he is given by virtue of the completed work of Jesus Christ. Having made atonement for our sins, God raised him from the dead, God took him up to heaven, God has given him the Holy Spirit in all his fullness to bestow upon his people on the earth. And that, I believe, is what John is speaking about here when he says, He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will give to his believing people this tremendous gift of the Holy Spirit. Well then, Let's ask this question, who or what, who or what is the Holy Spirit? First of all, the Bible makes clear that the Holy Spirit, like the Lord Jesus himself, is personal. The Holy Spirit is not simply some kind of force or power. If you have friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses or Ecclesia and Christo, they do not believe that the Holy Spirit is personal. To them, he is a mere power, but there is nothing personal about him. 
But when we look at what the Bible teaches, we find that the Holy Spirit has every characteristic of personality. He is an intelligent being. He knows the things of God and reveals them to his people. Paul speaks about the mind of the Spirit. The Spirit inspired the Scriptures. The Scriptures weren't inspired by some impersonal force. The Spirit has the characteristic of being an intelligent mind. He has affections. The Bible speaks about the love of the Spirit. He has will. The apostles following the Council of Jerusalem, they say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay down these principles for the churches. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit to do this. That is a clear indication of will, choice, decision, as well as intelligence and affection. And when Jesus speaks about the, the coming of the Holy Spirit to be with his disciples when he is gone, he says things like this. He says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter. When Jesus is taken up, the Father will send another comforter. The, the, the Greek word there is parakletos, it means an advocate, a helper, and it is used elsewhere of Jesus himself. It's not translated that way, but in 1 John 2 verse 1, we are told if any man sin, we have an advocate, we have a parakletos with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When Jesus says, I will send you another paraclete, he himself is the first paraclete. He is our advocate, our helper, and I'm going to send you another who will be your internal advocate and helper. He is personal just as Jesus is personal. And in John 16 verse 7, Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Apart from the use of the, the masculine pronoun, he doesn't speak of it, but of him, I will send him. But apart from that, who is it? that can actually be an advantage to have with us rather than Christ on earth. It can only be a person. And the Holy Spirit is personal. Like the Lord Jesus, he is a distinct person. He is not simply another description, another way of describing God. He is God the Spirit. At Jesus' baptism, the Father spoke from heaven and the Spirit descended like a dove upon Christ the Son. You have there the three persons, the Father, the Spirit, the Son. Jesus says, I, Christ, will pray the Father and he shall send another paraclete. In the benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, that is the Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit. We have here the three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And like the Lord Jesus, the Spirit is God. He is the eternal Spirit. We saw the relevance of Christ being the eternal word. There is only one eternal, and that is God. The eternal spirit is God. He is the omnipresent spirit. Psalm 119, where can I go from your spirit? The psalmist cannot be anywhere in the universe 
but the Spirit is there. There is only one who is omnipresent, and that is God. And just as the Lord Jesus is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Word who is in the beginning with God, so the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. That third person who has from all eternity dwelt in the fellowship of the Father and the Son, one God with the Father and the Son, the Spirit to be equally worshipped and adored. What does the Holy Spirit do? Well, like Christ himself, he participated in the work of creation. He's first mentioned in Genesis 1 verse 2, the second verse of the Bible, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit was present, the Spirit was active in the creation of the heaven and earth. Like Christ, he was active throughout the whole of the Old Testament period. Genesis 6.3, God says, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. There we have the clear intimation that God's spirit was striving with men in that time of terrible apostasy and wickedness before the flood, but the Spirit of God was striving to call men to repentance. But God says it will not happen forever. The Spirit was active in the prophets throughout the Old Testament, speaking through them. He empowered men to do great things in the service of God. And like Christ, the Holy Spirit participated in the great work of redemption, the work of salvation. We must never, never think of salvation as being simply the work of Christ. We must never think only of Christ, our Saviour. Mary speaks of my spirit rejoicing in God, my Saviour. And salvation is the work of God, the triune God. It is the work of the Father. It is the work of the Son. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Blessed Trinity are involved in the great work of the salvation of God's people. The Holy Spirit was active in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus himself. He was involved in the incarnation. Do you remember when Mary was told by the angel that she would bring forth a son and uh, who would reign forever and so on? Uh, she, she is dumbfounded and she says, how shall this be? How can this be? And the answer, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. And therefore that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit was present and active in the incarnation of Christ. The human nature of the Lord Jesus was formed by the Holy Spirit from the substance of the Virgin Mary. The Holy Spirit was involved in Jesus' earthly ministry. At baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him, as we read, and we must understand that that was not something purely symbolic. The Spirit descended upon the Lord Jesus, anointing him for his messianic office, and the Spirit remained upon him. We see that in verse 32 here. 
I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. Verse 33, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. And throughout his ministry, the Spirit of the law, or the Spirit of God rested upon the Lord Jesus, anointing him for his messianic work. In Luke 4, in what follows immediately after that, Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 14, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Luke 4, 18, standing in the synagogue in Nazareth, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and so on. And the Holy Spirit was intimately involved in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very term Messiah, which is the Hebrew word, or Christ, which is the Greek word, they mean the same thing. They mean the anointed one, anointed by the Holy Spirit for his messianic work. And Peter, when he's speaking to Cornelius, um, preaching the gospel to him, he says, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And uh, we see very clearly that in the ministry of the Lord Jesus, he was upheld, supported at all times by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was involved in Jesus' death. Hebrews 9.14, we read that Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God. The Spirit enabled the Lord Jesus to give himself a sacrifice for our sins. And the Spirit is active in applying Christ's saving work to God's people. How does what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, how does that relate to men and women in the world today? How does the work of Christ, who is now in heaven, relate to men and women who are here in this world? How does Christ, the head of the church, in heaven, how does he provide for his church here in this earth? The answer to all of these is, through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the link between Christ and his people. The great work of the Holy Spirit today is to apply to men and women personally and individually the saving work of Jesus Christ. That is the work of of the Holy Spirit. Well, what can we say about the work of the Spirit in the lives of God's people? First of all, the Holy Spirit is the author of the new birth. It is the Holy Spirit by whom we are born again. Man's natural condition is one of spiritual death. His mind is blind, his emotional life is in turmoil, his will is enslaved to sin, and it is the Spirit who 
recreates. It is the Spirit who renews. It is the Spirit who takes that which is dead and gives life. It is the Spirit through whom we are born again. Jesus is very clear about that. In chapter 3 of this Gospel, verse 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. It is the Holy Spirit who enables the sinner to hear God's word. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts of the truth of God. It's the Holy Spirit who enables us to repent, who enables us to believe and to be saved. Every Christian believer is the product of the work of the Holy Spirit, given given as a consequence of the saving work of Christ poured out upon his people and now drawing sinners to Jesus Christ. The Spirit is the author of the new birth. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer. In the Old Testament, God dwelt with the people of Israel. He dwelt in the tabernacle and in the temple. He manifested his presence in this particular locality which was amongst the people of Israel. During Jesus' earthly ministry, God dwelt on earth in the person of the Lord Jesus. We read before, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. In Jesus Christ, God dwelt with his people. And then we've already seen that as Jesus prepared his disciples for, their de for his departure, he assured them that he would send the Holy Spirit to be with them forever. And he did this at Pentecost and Paul can write subsequently to the Corinthians, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? The temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God and you are not your own? The Christian believer is a temple because the Holy Spirit dwells within him. That was the point of the tabernacle and the temple there in the, uh, among the people of Israel in the Old Testament. That was where God dwelt and manifested his presence. Jesus speaks of himself in a similar way when he says, destroy this temple, the temple of his body, because while he was on earth, he was the dwelling place of God. Now that Christ is returned to heaven, believers are the temple of God. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? It is the will of God to dwell in men to dwell in each and every believer. And if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit has his dwelling in you. The Holy Spirit seals each believer. Some of us were looking at this in the Sunday and Wednesday Bible studies quite recently. Ephesians 1 verse 13. In Christ you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in him also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And in Ephesians 4, verse 
Um, I've lost the, the reference there. Never mind. One will do. Um, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. A seal was a mark of ownership, authenticity, and a mark of security. And the Holy Spirit is God's seal in the individual believer. The presence of God the Holy Spirit dwelling in you is God's infallible mark of ownership that you belong to him. That Christ has purchased you. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. And that God is resolved to bring you finally to glory and to be with him forever. The Holy Spirit seals the believer until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. It's the work of the Spirit to make believers holy. And the Spirit leads us into holiness by applying to us the gospel and by leading us into the paths of Christian obedience. He uses the means of grace. He uses his word, the word which he himself has inspired. He uses prayer and the Spirit himself helps us in our prayers. He uses the sacraments, he uses Christian fellowship and so on, but none of these means of grace as we call them, none of them would have any independent value separated from the Holy Spirit. They are instruments in the hands of the Spirit and the Spirit sanctifies his people, he makes them holy. The Holy Spirit gives assurance of salvation. Is it possible for a believer to be sure of being a Christian? It's not only possible, it is the will of God that we should be sure. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit to give this assurance. The Holy Spirit is able to bring home to our hearts the promises of the gospel with such power and conviction that the believer can no longer doubt that he believes in Christ and that believing he has eternal life. That's one way in which the Spirit gives assurance. Again, the Holy Spirit bears fruit in the believer's life. And that fruit is a confirmatory evidence of the reality that his faith is not a barren, fruitless faith which will be rejected on the last day. But the fruit of the Spirit is evidence that this person is the real thing, that God is in him. And then we read in Romans 8, verses 15 to 17, of something further. Paul says, You did not receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption or sonship by whom we cry out Abba Father. That word cry out it implies a, a cry from the very depth of our being. The spirit of sonship by whom we cry out Abba Father. The spirit himself is bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And the Holy Spirit is the one who assures of salvation. If you hope this morning, if you hope 
that you are a Christian and yet you lack assurance, you lack a certainty, the Holy Spirit is able to give you assurance of being a child of God. The Holy Spirit unites Christian believers in one body with one spirit we are all baptized into one body there is one body and one spirit without the indwelling spirit the church would not be the body of Christ the church is united together by this that the Holy Spirit indwells each and every member where the Spirit is absent, there can be no true church. There may be a religious organization, but not a church. A church means that the Spirit himself dwells in the members, unites them together as the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit helps us in worship, Jesus says in John 4, 23-24, the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Ephesians 2, 18, for through him, that's Christ, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Philippians 3, 3, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. When we worship, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. Whether it be in our own personal devotions, whether it be when we come together as a church, we need the Spirit to lead us, to prompt us, to enable us. To pray. Paul says we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself helps us. The Spirit um, makes groanings which cannot, he makes intercession for us in groanings which cannot be uttered. How do we recognize the presence of the Spirit in our worship? Not by weird and mystical things happening. We recognize the presence of the Spirit by the exaltation of Christ. When we are brought to see the reality of the truth about the Lord Jesus, his glorious person, his glorious work. And when the Spirit gives us some sense, some awareness of the reality, the reality of eternal things. When we are able to have some perception that we have come into the presence of God. And then the Holy Spirit empowers for service. When the Lord commissioned the apostles to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, he commanded them to do something first. He said they were not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But they could not begin. They could not begin to fulfill their commission until they had been endued with power from on high. We cannot serve Jesus Christ. We cannot achieve anything in the work of the kingdom of God apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. We can achieve nothing within the context of the church seeking to minister one to another without the Holy Spirit. 
we can achieve nothing in the realm of evangelism, seeking to reach out to others, fulfilling the Great Commission. We can achieve nothing without the Holy Spirit. Power for Christian service comes from the Holy Spirit himself. And everything, everything in the Christian life is dependent upon the grace and the power of God the Holy Spirit. And John said, this is the one, Christ, Jesus, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Well, very, very briefly, what's our practical responsibility towards the Holy Spirit? One, we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit, to be controlled by the Spirit. We must listen to the Holy Spirit who speaks to us not in weird ways by dreams and visions. He speaks to us in his word. We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit by being filled with the word of God. How much time do you spend with the word of God? And not only academic reading, increasing your head knowledge, but you must bring your life under the control of the Spirit by listening to his word and applying it. Are you a hearer or a hearer and a doer of God's word? And you must pray. We are exhorted to pray in the Spirit and to be filled with the Spirit. You cannot be filled with the Spirit in your life unless you are filled with the Word of God and you pray in the Holy Spirit with the help of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And uh, in Ephesians 4 verse um, 30, which is the verse I was looking for and couldn't find a minute ago. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And in the context in which these words are spoken, it is evident that he means do not grieve the Spirit by division and anger and evil speaking and malice, but be filled with the Spirit, forgiving one another, being kind and tender-hearted. Do not grieve the Spirit by sinning against the body which he has created. And finally, do not quench the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. How can we quench the Spirit? We can quench the Spirit simply by behaving as though we can live without him. Self-sufficiency, whether personally in our Christian walk, whether corporately in our life as a church, we can do all the things that a church does and we can have our schedules and our plans and so on and we can leave out the Holy Spirit and the Spirit is quenched. We must realize our dependence upon the Spirit. Personally, as a Christian, you owe everything to the working of the Spirit within you. Corporately as a church, we are absolutely dependent upon the grace, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us then take heed to the exhortation, be filled with the Spirit. 
It is Christ who has baptized his church with the Spirit. Let us seek to be filled with the Spirit and to live in a manner that glorifies God. Amen.